We are all told to believe that advanced economies, our modern world, is infinite in its capacity to adapt to all changes. It's a concept I don't agree with at all. Our modern advanced economies are godchildren of a mild, relatively stable environment. That relatively stable environment enables long-term and large-scale investment in infrastructure and production. Without that predictability, we can't anticipate a return on investment. And in the face of a chronically changing and shifting material environment, our existing infrastructure, anything we might decide to build, could be outright destroyed or simply become unfit for purpose. Oddly enough, a chronic erosion of existing productive capacity is no recipe for prosperity or growth. We might be lucky simply to run in place. The flooding crisis in Damaji lays bare these dynamics. Damaji is a poor rural district of the northeastern Indian state of Assam. Historically abundant in water because of the many tributaries of the Brahmaputra that flows through it. And, as a result, it is a region intrinsically prone to seasonal flooding. And, historically, the regional communities were perfectly well adapted to handling monsoon season. They knew how to build, where to build, and how to defend against the floods that would come every year. But that has changed recently. In the last decade or two, the region has been subjected to frequent devastating floods, made significantly worse by the economic development pursued since the 70s. The region's rich soil attracted immigrants who cleared the forest for cropland, along with the other forms of deforestation pursued everywhere around the world. Without the flood mitigating benefits of regional forests that trap silt washed from the mountains in which deflects and buffers the ferocity of a flood, the region has suffered soil erosion and smothering deposits of sand in a process that alters the very river itself. In short, the combination of climate change and economic development has now resulted in them, the people in this region, suffering a striking decline in their own economic prospects. I have my doubts that modern society, a modern economy, is um, will show the flexibility necessary to adapt to emerging circumstances. Consider for a moment the case circumstance of one of the residents of Dimaji. She's lost not only her crop and her home, barely escaping with her life, she's also lost the land she uses to sustain herself with. The river simply has taken, taken it away from her. She is left with absolutely nothing, including the land she had been cultivating. What does the concept of property even mean in an environment like this, where Mother Nature enthusiastically engages in frequent hostile takeovers of territory we used to be able to consider somewhat permanent and enduring, which a lending institution would accept as a collateral for a loan? And I'd like to suggest that this issue scales up. In an environment of frequent natural disasters, what bank, what development agency is going to be willing to risk investing in a region like this? Because even if they could surmount the issues of ensuring the construction of a project, will the climate remain consistent enough over enough years to actually reap a return on investment? Will the region even be able to engage in the economic activity you had been banking on? And I will point out here that the existing croplands are all suffering a steady decline in their productive capacity. 
might be time to take a clue from the home insurance industry and um, reconsider whether or not this invulnerability is as good as advertised. Restoration of forest areas is going to be a necessary step, and I would expect normally that restoration of this kind would be a source of conflict for the people who would be losing their land. The alternative is a system of permaculture that embeds within permaculture grounds uh, plots for cash crops. The greatest feature of permaculture is it is a system of cultivation that can sustain a community, sustain their basic needs. This is a quarter acre. This is a very small plot that literally provides all of the financial needs of this family. And provide the benefits of a natural ecology. It's the best of both worlds, really. And because croplands, cash croplands, can be embedded within a larger permaculture territory, um, I would almost guess that at the very least if uh, that system didn't stabilize the living conditions of the residents of Dejima, it might actually turn out to be a better system. And in this, I'd like to leave you with a thought of whether or not modern advanced economies really are capable of um, adapting in the ways that I've just described because the agricultural sector has gotten very specific ideas about how to go about um, maximizing profit. These um, modalities are not exactly fit for purpose, or may not, for large portions of the world. It's just not going to work. Beyond that argument, uh, I would like to direct your attention to a series of articles uh, that have been appearing in the New Republic and um, helpfully titled, How to Avoid Food System Collapse. And they aren't talking about rural districts in India. They're talking about food collapse, food system collapse. In North America and Europe, the mid-Atlantic currents that define the regional climate um, of Europe and of North America. Looks like it's slowing down, and it might actually collapse entirely. And if it does so, this will lead to crop failures in North America and Europe. You basically think um, all the food disruptions we've seen from the war on Ukraine um, on steroids. And in order to build resilience, you basically have to break up big agriculture and rebuild the redundancy in the system that modern business practice has devoted so much time and effort to eliminating. Resilience comes from redundancy and from minimizing exposure to externalities. So you have to break up large farms. You have to reduce their dependency, farm dependency, on inputs like pesticides, fertilizers, maybe seeds that are grown and you know and imported from exotic um, seed developers, and um, basically decouple the system so that it is naturally capable of functioning <laughs> without this sort of very elaborate fertilizer, pesticide, smart technology, drone-driven direction that uh, the agricultural system has embraced and uh, continues to pursue. It's not fit for purpose anymore. And outside of that, um, in general, our modern economy, especially in the United States, has been the victim of 
far too little antitrust. We need to actually become much less efficient if we are going to save the concept of a market economy in the first place, which um, I think the United States is supposed to be the champion of. But um, yeah, that's another topic. The article, it's a very telling point. The article near the end specifically mentions that local communities who had been pursuing food resilience for themselves ended up being better able to adapt to the disruptions brought on by COVID supply chain disruptions. And um, so I'd like to suggest that there's ample proof that um, this process of resilience, building resilience, is uh, generally a good idea. But I would push it to go a little bit further because climate change will dramatically affect food security everywhere. But it's also incumbent on us to ensure, in our communities, to ensure that we can cover the basics. That's food, that's water, that's energy, that's housing. And I think housing is probably the least worrisome priority, but pays to consider these issues. Because in a world where natural disasters become more prevalent, um, we're going to have to expect to be able to ride out over bumps. And we're going to have to, you know, anticipate being able to glide over a few weeks, a few months, maybe a year's worth of disruption. Um, it sounds pretty crazy, but um, I'd like to point out that Asia is currently baking to death and being drowned in um, torrents of rain. China is having a wonderful time right now. While heat waves are um, devastating most of India. India is actually one of the largest exporters of rice. Um, and China is not self-sufficient in its food supply. Hint there. Um, if Asia the world's manufacturer endures food crises, water crises. Both of these um, can't happen by even in the midst of flooding because the flooding can also destroy manufacturing centers as much as drought can suffocate them. Um, if Asia ends up shutting down that means that um, the world's manufacturer will shut down. And that means that the world's manufacturer who supplies all the equipment that builds all the things that we might build domestically also shut down. Or, one Petruchka doll further, all the components that are used to build all the machines that would be used for national onshore production would also become quite scarce. The nasty reality is, is we live in an extremely interdependent world and it doesn't take much more than the right Janga puzzle piece being pulled out from the edifice of the world's modern economy to bring the whole mess into a state of collapse, at least for days, weeks, months, maybe a year. That's the real reality we have to come to terms with. It's what Mother Nature is, that's the challenge Mother Nature is putting in front of us, and it's up to us to adapt or die. <laughs>